Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 25th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone present, please, to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? We have received apologies from Fulton McGregor this morning. The first item on the agenda is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider item three in private relate, relating to the proposed aquaculture inquiry. Are all members agreed? agreed? That is agreed. I therefore would like to move on to agenda item two, which is the second evidence session on the Islands Scotland Bill. There will be two panels. The first panel I'd like to welcome here consists of Fergus Murray, the Head of Economic Development and Strategic Transportation of Argyll and Butte Council. Andrew Fraser, Head of Democratic Services, North Ayrshire Council. And Dr Audrey Sutton, the Head of Connected Communities, North Ayrshire Council. Just in case you haven't given evidence before, you don't need to push any buttons on your, on your console. That will all be done for you. And that we have various themes which we're going to go through, which will be led by members. And I would ask, if you want to respond, if you try and catch my eye, I will bring you in. And if you all look the other way, I will try and bring one of you in who, who doesn't look away quick enough. So, on that basis, uh, I'd like to start off with and ask uh, John Finney uh, to start off, please. Hey, thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel, and thanks for some of your contributions. <coughs> Excuse me, can I ask whether the overall intention of the, the bill is in line with expectations? Please. Andrew. Yeah, I have to start. Yeah, very much so, I have to say. I think probably the broad view is that um, A, it accords with the general direction of travel in terms of the Christie Commission, the subsidiarity, locality planning, and it's an extension of that which targets the particular needs of islands. So I think uh, the broad direction of it, um, absolutely, I'm conscious the bill is quite broad in its terms, but I think it's very much the starting point. So from that point of view, certainly from a North Ayrshire point of view, we're um, very much support its aims. Yes, um, I think um, Butte comes the bill, um, and I think there's there's a lot of provisions that um, the the council welcomes. I think there's some concerns, and I'm, I'm reflecting the views of our island communities that we have consulted before we came here in terms of. It, it could have maybe gone a little bit further. Um, it could have addressed some issues that. Um, that the, the island communities may be expected to see, but uh, there's a kind of understanding maybe that's coming later through the, the, the national plan process and, and other aspects. Uh, John, do you want to follow that up? I think perhaps Audrey wanted to come in. Oh, yes. Audrey, sorry, yes. I, I, I was taking you in uh, with your response in line with Andrew's, but maybe that was wrong. Sorry, Audrey. Thank you. Um, like Fergus, I, I'd like to balance, I think, the, the views of our own communities with the, the views of North Ayrshire. And certainly um, in line with Andrew and Fergus, there is a recognition in the bill of the considerable work that we did around the consultation um, with our Future Islands Bill. So I think that work stood us in good stead and the elements of the bill that have emerged from that work um, feels right to the islanders. But I think like Fergus too, the devil will be in the detail and they would very much, I think, like to have explored more of the detail than is available to us um, at this stage. With what we have in front of us at this stage, do you think this will lead to greater empowerment for island communities? Will I? Happy for me. Yeah. The sense on the part of our island communities is that it will be a delicate balance between the national islands plan, the role of the local authorities, and then the role of the island communities. And again, they're very, very keen, I think, to be involved in that debate as it continues. I think the potential is there. But again, the detail will be really important in terms of the relationship between, for example, the single outcome agreement, the local outcomes improvement plans, and as Andrew said, the importance, um, particularly to us in North Ayrshire, of locality planning. We've co-produced that with our, our scheme of decentralisation with our communities. So we've come to a place where we're really in a, a powerful place around the, the sense of locality planning. So we need to make sure, I think, that you know, all of these things respect each other. Fergus, do you want to come in there? Yes, I, I think from the, the communities um, um, are hopeful, very hopeful that the bill will, will enable that to happen. I think they're a bit wary of top-down or, or, or kind of um, kind of top-down decisions coming through the bill or controls 
coming from Edinburgh. I think they're very much looking to see how powers can be delegated down closer to their communities. And that's very strongly come across from the island communities that we've spoken to. Uh, as usual in Argyll and Butte, there's a lot of variation in that as well, in terms of some islands are very, very strong in terms of what they want to control, and others are a bit more relaxed about it. But I think there is a general, not fear, but a little bit of apprehension that's not another way to have more controls on uh, island communities. And so it's just to reflect that. Can also ask about the, the chronology of the, 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 the background to the bill. The, the three island authorities that, um, are, you know, clearly have a, a different uh, range of challenges to yourselves. Do you think the mainland authorities with islands, inhabited islands, were in quick enough into the process? Would you have preferred to have had greater input earlier? Audrey, it looks like you were about to... You didn't look away quick enough, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, some of that, I think, depends on the relationships that exist locally. So in terms of hearing the vo voices of the island communities, um, and I'm sure Fergus is the same, our island communities feel very much as if they have a voice. So on Arran and on Cumbria, we already have our locality planning partnerships and health and social care partnerships, which are contiguous. Um, we have the Arran and Cumbria economic fora and economic plans. So in terms of the sense that they've had their voices heard, I think they do feel as if that has been very well reflected in the bill. In terms of the local authorities themselves, um, yeah, I think there is a sense perhaps that we're less experienced in the process of considering island proofing and the political agenda around the islands, although clearly it's always been you know, central to, to some of our thinking. So potentially we, we may feel less experienced in this. Andrew, do you want to add to that? Or? Just, I suppose, the point that there probably was an appreciation that what the three island councils were trying to do was something that would benefit all the councils which had islands, and certainly we we were engaged with them in, informally and, and had an overview of what their aims were and there was nothing in, in what they were trying to do which, which prejudiced our position as a combination of mainland and, and, and a, an island authority. Um, I think, we, harking back to an earlier point, I think it is important to recognise that obviously islands are different, um, that the national plan and the national guidance uh, shouldn't try and categorise islands as being one type. You know, clearly you've places like Cumbria that essentially uh, you can commute to the centre of Glasgow from there on a, on a day basis. That that's very much different from some of the more remote islands. Um, but equally all of them will share some commonality, such as transport links in particular. Fergus, you want Yes, I, I think there's as a little bit of sense from Argyll and Butte we, we came to the party a little bit late. And I think there's a, a number of reasons for that. Maybe it's not our, um, from ourselves a lack of a full understanding of the significance of the discussions at the early stages, the um, other priorities within our council in terms of having to deal with a whole range of different issues. But we very much feel as if um, um, we're catching up, we recognise the importance of this and we're strongly of the view of you know playing a full part in this. And that's certainly reflected from our communities. Our island communities have a sense that we have come to a bit late and maybe that's how the the, the, the bill has been drafted, maybe not taking into account of our gallon, but that's what's come from the, our kind of um, consultation with the communities. John, do you want to come back? Uh, then, do, do you feel part of the party now? Are you, are you fully included? Very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for that. That seems to be nods all round. Uh, Raider, I think you were next. Yes, um, <clears throat> the bill covers island council areas and also mixed island mainland council areas. Where do you think the challenges lie? I mean, we <coughs> both represent uh, council areas that have islands rather than island councils. Do you think that's going to be more difficult for you to meet the aspirations of the bill? Or are there challenges specifically there for yourselves? Or does the bill deal with that adequately? Andrew, I'll let you come in. There. Yeah, I think it does adequately deal with it if you look at this through the, the lens, essentially, of locality planning and subsidiarity. Um, that really, um, the, the bill is about 
uh, essentially about the Christie objective of um, empowering islands, about community planning partners working together with community uh, to target uh, priorities and objectives uh, specific to the needs of, of those individual islands. And in many ways, that's no different for, for other communities in our area. So, for example, North Ayrshire split our, our area into six individual localities, um, all of whom have essentially their own demographic profile and their own individual needs. And I don't think um, the Islands Bill focus on, for example, Arran or Cumbria in any way detracts from a similar locality planning process dealing with our mainland areas, which in our case have, have more deprivation often. Fergus, do you want to come in on that? Yes, uh, I think it's it, it's certainly um, it makes it more complex from our for, from our point of view in the consideration of the close relationship between islands and remote peninsulas, and I think the islands have picked this up in terms of of concern that there, there may be potential to create inequalities in bet between these communities, and actually the the islanders themselves are actually talking about it because the difference and nature of our islands, there could be potential to create inequalities between different island cluster groups or groups. So I think it's it's just, you know, um, the need to take quite care in, in, in how, how the bill is, is taken forward, the decisions that are come forward, so they don't actually do something that it's not wanting to do, is create inequalities within very close-lying communities that have extremely strong relationships with each other. And the island communities and, and, and Argyll Argy and Butte strongly recognise that and, and wish that the bill, you know, takes full account of that as it moves forward. Ray, did you want to follow? Um, given the island councils probably have a stronger negotiating position with Scottish Government under the bill to try and get devolved powers, would they not, though, face the same issues within their island groupings? Um, you know, there's always, I think, in all the three main, there's a bigger island, and then there's the smaller islands. And the smaller islands may have the same aspirations as the mixed mainland island council areas, <coughs> in that they would be looking, looking at, I suppose, the centre and saying, we want... It's not just about devolving powers to the island council, it's the island council devolving powers to the other islands. Would that not fit the same, or is there specific challenges just because of the geography? Fergus, I'm going to let you... You, yeah. you, you were sort of ready well, for that one. Yeah, I'm, con uh, I'm conscious who's in the audience, but um, in terms of uh, what we have here, I mean, I, I totally recognise what you're saying. I mean, I, I lived in Shetland for 11 years, there was a different relationship between the mainland of Shetland and some of the outer islands of Shetland. There was actually a difference between the town of Lerwick and the rural community. So, but I think there may be as it, it, there is more um, specific issues that you have to deal with in terms of um, remote peninsulars. So, I, I, th I think it's um, it's. It's more complex in Argyll and Butte, maybe, than, than in the island communities. I can't, I can't really sp speak for the, for the other islands. I can only speak from Argyll and Butte and what, what, what they have said in terms of um, the kind of um, concerns that they have in terms of, of um, what's ever happens for the islands, which is welcomed in terms of additional powers or delegation or control that somehow that's, that, that, that doesn't disadvantage the remote, remote rural areas that, that, that lie next to them. Uh, Andrew, do you want to answer that briefly? Just, it's not so much of an issue for North Ayrshire because essentially we have, have two distinct islands, um, uh, Great Cumbria and, uh, and, uh, and Arran. Um, but I think your point is very much one of subsidiarity. And if there is a, a genuine commitment by all engaged, the principle of subsidiarity, that equally applies for the larger islands, taking it forward to the smaller islands. And I think from a bill point of view, it promotes that principle of subsidiarity by recognising the needs of islands communities and, and allowing them to be addressed. Audrey, are you happy it's answered? I mean, I might let Rhoda come back in before you, if, if there's something you want. I, I think there's a, an issue in here which underlies some of this, which is about the capacity um, and the willingness and determination of some of our communities um, to require 
our, our demand more subsidiarity. And certainly, we probably could say that on the islands, um, the social capital and the capacity of the island communities, partly because I think of the resilience that island communities require to have, um, would define the communities and define the ask of the island communities of the local authority or of, of Scottish government. So I think a lot of this is about capacity and relationships. So we can determine principles of subsidiarity or locality planning, but a lot of that will be what comes through from the communities themselves and how we manage the relationships. And, and what we've tried to do in North Asia through locality planning, because it's a very powerful driver for us, what we've tried to do is ensure um, transparency and visibility across the whole of the, the local authority in terms of understanding and that reciprocity, I suppose, of um, prioritisation. So our urban communities understand the issues of the island communities and vice versa. So there's an issue in here of the capacity and the managing, I think, of, of the local circumstances, which sits separately from the theory. Roger, I'll let you uh, uh, follow up if you'd like to. Just on, just on that point, are, are you saying then that the bill's aims are okay, but how island communities will be able to implement them and live up to them really depends on the, you know, the the, the fabric of that community, the know-how of the people that live there, the size of it, I guess, for want of just economies and knowledge. I would say that's certainly a factor, but clearly the support that they're given to maximise the potential of the bill is also going to be an important factor as well. Okay. Um, just um, a final question. You talked about um, being left behind by our islands and our future and coming to it late in the day. Why was that? Was it that mainland island, mainland island councils didn't feel that this was for them at that point, or was it that the island councils were... <laughs> We're kind of stealing a march on you. Um, yeah, yeah, Audrey, briefly, if you, if, yeah. if, if, if you may, please. Absolutely. Um, I think the point I made, perhaps badly, was that we, in North Asia, were very fully engaged in the islands, our future work, and that set the, um, the context, I think, for our continued involvement in the, the next stages. Andrew, do you want to say something? Just, I think it's also important to recognise that, you know, for example, the, my understanding is the boundaries proposals in the bill actually came from Arran. That, you know, that, that arose from a meeting between Arran community groups and the then minister. So it wasn't as if we were, we were cut out in any way. I think, to be frank, the, the, the three island councils were doing such a good job. We, we, we really didn't want to prejudice what they were doing. Um, I'm going to bring Liam in at that stage because I think you had a small question. Just, just following up, um, Rose, I, mean, I think it's worth reflecting that our islands, our future, was born out of recognition of the three island authorities that very often um, they didn't play to their strengths in terms of what united them. Um, it was too often there was opportunities to play one off against the other. Uh, and actually a lot of that was, was driving the, the, the process initially. But I was interested by Dr Sutton's um, point there about the, the different capacity in, in islands. Do you, require, do you think that, that the bill will require to provide safeguards for those island communities where there isn't perhaps either the appetite or the capacity to take on some of the, the powers and the responsibilities that may um, flow through this, uh, this bill? Um, to avoid a situation where it's simply foisted upon them and they're told to get on with it, where, where in a sense they're potentially being set up for failure, that unlocking the, the potential of violence is one thing, but that needs to be gauged by the island communities themselves. That's a yes or no answer, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll want to flesh it out a wee bit, but, but I would like to bring all the panel in on that, so if, if, if you could keep it short, and, and I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I think one of the notable features of the bill is the links with the Community Empowerment Act, and um, I think the spirit of the, the, the two documents feels in places very similar. So, yes, and I think if we see them in parallel and we see the advantages, the support, the capacity building that's inherent within the Community Empowerment Act, then the two, I think, um, complement each other. Thank Andrew, you. do you want to add anything um, to that? Just very, very briefly, I think that the guidance will need to support empowerment and avoid, I suppose, the risk of trying to impose minimum standards, which might in turn be, be viewed as being being trying to impose a one-size-fits-all approach, which, given the diversity of islands, I think would, wouldn't work. I, I would agree with that. I think it's essential 
that there is given the given the the range and size of, of our islands, some for very few people on it, um, some some islands more isolated than others, others have got relationships. I think there, there needs to be some safeguards to help empower communities or to, to give them the the experience and skills to take full advantage of the bill. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on from there and uh, ask Jamie to, to lead off on the next bit, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. I have very, uh, three very distinct questions, so, uh, and I would like to try and get through them all, so don't feel obliged to answer every question. Uh, uh, the first one is around the, I guess, the strategy of the bill is to <clears throat> uh, enable a, a national islands plan to be presented to Parliament. Um, in that respect, does the panel have any views on whether they think that is the best approach to allow the bill to actually uh, enable island communities or empower island communities? In other words, uh, by creating a, a, a strategy rather than uh, put detail in the bill itself, uh, do you think that's the right approach? Andrew, do you want to lead on that? Um. I'd say it's, it's important to set out the overall strategy and to link it to community empowerment and, and to, to Christia and, and locality planning and so on. So I think from that point of view, you know, a clear statement of, of, of government strategy is, is absolutely essential. Um, I think the difficulty, though, is in including precise provisions within the bill is the, is the diversity of islands in particular. Uh, and I suppose I, I view very much this bill as the, as the starter for 10, really. It's, it's a developing journey. So um, I, I can't think of anything better than to have a national strategy. Um, I'm sure others might have some reservations, but I, I can't propose any alternative, certainly. Fergus, you were nodding at that. Are you, are you agreeing with that? Well, it, it's, um, I think there's strong support from our communities in terms of a, of a national island strategy, but um, they're also very kind of um, clear that it needs to come down to a level to maybe Argyll and Butte level or island, even island level in terms of dealing with the issues, the different issues islands have. So it's not like a one size fit all, but they're welcoming of it. Maybe some of the key themes or something is, is through that, um, but they're also looking for a provision that is broken down to a more uh, local level as well. Jamie, that came quite clear. Do you want to go with your next question as well? Great, yes. Um, so, I mean, I, I, that leads nicely into my next question, was based on some of, some of the feedback we had on the committee visit to Mull uh, uh, in one of the sessions there, the feedback was very much that the, the bill itself lacked a specific objective. Uh, it was an island's bill and it would create uh, the a path or a, a national strategy to be introduced, but the bill itself didn't have any specific aims or objectives. Do you have a view on the bill in its current draft? Audrey, do you want to lead on that? Very quickly, certainly. I think the, the view that was coming from our island communities is pretty much you know, in line with, with what you've described. But I think it's important to separate <coughs> out in the principles of the bill um, the approach that would be driven by a bill and the issues that may be tackled by, by some of the, the legislation. Um, and certainly the underpinning view of the island communities is that can be overcome by co-production of a national strategy because they certainly have very clear views. But again, the top-down approach without a clear view of what the... Certainly the vision, I think, is clear, but the objectives are less clear. And if they could be co-produced, I think there would be huge buy-in to, to developing the appropriate approach. the objectives should be in the bill or in the strategy? I think to an extent the island communities would be reassured by having some of the objectives in the strategy so it's a clearer understanding of what is nationally trying to be achieved. Uh, Fergus, do you want to, to comment on that at all? Um, I, I, I don't have a, cl a clear view whether it should be in the bill. I think the, the, in terms of the... Our communities are recognising maybe what the bill is uh, as an enabler, they're very keen to see what the national plan says in terms of what the what what would be the you know key themes or the key aims of that. So they're and they're very very keen to be involved in that in terms of how to frame it and to involve a wider range of uh, community views as that's been developed um, to maybe guide the, the the key principles of what what we're trying to achieve in these island communities. 
that that's that's kind of the, the kind of feeling that's come through from our consultation. Right, so Jamie, you just thank you. Uh, I, I, I think it's it's clear that um, there's some there's some commonality in some of the issues that island communities <coughs> face and have faced for for a very long time, such as transportation issues, uh, affordable housing, access to mainland healthcare services, social care, and so on. And we've had lots of anecdotal evidence of that. Um, <clears throat> When I questioned the uh, Scottish Government team last week uh, during our evidence session, uh, Ian Turner, uh, uh, to the same question of whether the bill should have more detail, responded, the bill could contain a list of issues that must be included in the National Islands Plan. I think you're right to expect transport and digital connectivity to be in the plan, for example. Uh, so again, this comes back to my question, is, is, is this bill lacking in terms of detail in terms of what should be in the plan, not necessarily what the plan is, but what should be in the plan. Is there an opportunity here uh, when the bill progresses through committee in various stages that we could ensure that the bill specifically lists certain areas of life that the bill must address or the strategy must address? Audrey, do you want to lead on that? I think our island communities would be disappointed if some of that detail wasn't at least enshrined in the approach. Um, you're all nodding, so I'm, I, I would agree. Uh, I would agree, and, and, and I think um, there is quite a long list of, of kind of overarching issues that are clearly identified that could be there. As long as it's not, I suppose it's the um, th that's the only things that would be considered in terms of if there's room for flexibility or issues that we haven't thought about in terms of because specific communities have strong views of different things. But I would agree there's there's a list of key things like digital connectivity, transport connectivity that should should be there. Sorry, can I just push slightly on that from, from the committee's point of view? Just to clarify, those things that you believe should be in the bill, do you think the island communities will be, dis sorry, in the plan, do you think island communities will, will be frustrated if they're not and it might undermine the whole point of the plan in the first place? I think our, our communities have expressed a bit of, of um, frustration about the lack of detail in terms of the bill, but we were trying to, you know, there was a kind, I suppose a debate or a thought that that might be reflected through the National Islands Plan in terms of dealt with through that. But if it could be, you know, dealt with before that stage, I think that would give them some reassurance that some of the critical issues that they they have and they've, they've had for generations can be you know dealt with through this this bill. Sorry, Jamie, I cut across here. If you want to, uh, no, to I think you, you, you make a, a good point, convener, and, and I think the, the difference here is whether these non-exhaustive list of items that should be addressed in the plan are in the plan or are referred to in the bill that they should be in the plan, and that's the, 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 what I'm getting at is is should the bill specifically list perhaps non-exhaustively issues that the plan must address, which it currently does not. Um, I'm seeing two of you nodding. Andrew's looking pensive, so do you want to...? Uh, I, I suppose it's partly, I'm partly thinking about what is the purpose of the National Islands Plan, and, and to me, it's probably twofold. One, it's to bring a strategic direction uh, to national policy and national agencies uh, and I think it would be useful um, for the bill to include a list of the national issues which the Islands Plan should address. But also I think the, the National Plan should encourage a process whereby local authorities, community planning partners, uh, would adopt a, da a data-led approach with their communities to identify the needs of specific islands uh, and, set, and you know, to get those priorities agreed and taken forward. So I think you need a process that A, captures the national issues, but B, uh, ensures that the particular needs of islands are addressed in, in a local context. That brings actually us on to the next question, which, which is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, yes, it does indeed. I wanted to ask about the level of consultation that you expect to see in relation to the um, Islands Plan. Do you think that the proposed timetable of a year after the Act comes into force is realistic? And going back to um, what was mentioned previously about top-down decision-making, how 
what level of the consultation, because when we, when we were in Mull, as was mentioned already, um, the, the members of our group were saying that they would like to be statutory consultees to all the decision making that goes on. So obviously the authorities will be consultees. How far down into the community would you like to see the consultation go? Quite a lot of questions in that. Um, I'm going to let Fergus kick off. Yes, um, well, uh, from, the, from the views expressed by the community, they've, they've got very strong views in terms of our consultation through that. Strong views from the islands communities that, that, um, that as many people within the islands group should be consulted as part of this process as we go forward. A very strong view that young people are somehow engaged in this because they're conscious that young people are struggling to get into it. Um, so, yes, um, the, there is a bit of debate uh, on how practical that would be, but in, in terms of it, from our communities, very strong, very strong views that, that, that island people have to be an integral part of this process as it goes on. I think the timescale was very ambitious in terms of, of, of dealing with an, a plan that's going to be robust and that's going to be um, and deal with the issues that the islands have, looking at land use plans and the times and the, and. and and, and a lot of that, of that process is about having realistic or meaningful engagement with stakeholders and groups and bodies. Um, so I, I would say that the, that certainly has to be highlighted, but there was a very, as I said, a strong view from the communities. If the, plan, if the, the bill is going to make a difference, island communities have to be integral to it coming forward and consulted. And do you want to add to that? I mean, only if there's additional things, or do you, if you think Fergus has covered it, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Audrey, Audrey, yeah. No, I mean, Audrey. Yeah, just add one thing. I think the response to invitations to be involved um, by our own communities will be really, really strong. So I, I think one of the, the things that emerged and, and I have to say this is probably quite normal, but one of the things that emerged was the care that we need to take, not just to engage with the usual suspects and with the standard range of consultees. So, for example, community councils um, don't necessarily have the levels and depth of engagement that we would like them to have in all of our communities. So, a strong message there that we have to consider a range of representative groups and organisations as well as individuals with clear views. And locally, we have the ability to do all of that, but I think we need to be given the time to do that because Ellen communities think it's a, a chance of a lifetime, you know, a kind of once in a generation opportunity. Um, and hopefully not, as we move forward into a more co-production um, process, that won't be the case, as Andrew described. So I think we'd rather do it properly than quickly. Okay. And I, I'm gonna, uh, I think the, the, the timescale you're all agreeing is, is ambitious. Um, <laughs> I want to move on, if I may, next to uh, Mike, who wants to talk about another issue. Thanks, Convener. Yes, I'd like to move on to the issue of island proofing. Um, when we were in Mo on the informal evidence, <clears throat> several people suggested to us, the islanders, that the only way to avoid a tick box exercise approach to this island proofing business was to ensure that you had real consultation with the islanders themselves. And what, what the bill does is to give a duty to the 60-odd plus uh, public bodies mentioned in the annex to island-proof any change in policy. Um, but what the islanders were saying to us was that they are afraid that this might turn into a, simply a tick-box exercise because if you've got 60 different public bodies, uh, they don't want somebody sitting in Edinburgh, Glasgow, wherever it is, um, just saying, oh, well, we've, lo we've looked at it as it will affect island X. That's fine, tick-box. And the only way to avoid that is actually to ask the islanders themselves, what do you feel about that? Um, Andrew, yes. Yeah, I, I think it is a very good point, and it's a similar issue which, in relation to equalities. I think the key point is that island proofing needs to be mainstreamed throughout all, proce all processes and all parts of a decision-making process. So it's not sufficient for example, to have made up your mind, gathered your evidence, got your recommendations, and then at the last minute do an island proof. You know, you should be thinking about the needs of islands, similarly to equalities, when you start doing your consultation and gathering your evidence. And that, and probably it would be helpful to have guidance on, on island proofing to, to that effect. Uh, Fergus, yes, sorry. 
Yeah, I, 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 I just, um, you know, it's a very strong um, response from the local communities. It can't just be a tick the box exercise. They, they, they see the proof in it. Our island proofing would be real evidence of agencies working together, coordinating things together and real results coming out of it. Um, it was very strongly um, in terms of the wanting to see and you know specific island impact assessments undertaken, you know real evidence that you know that the things are making a difference and and re re you know regularly reporting back to communities on how how different initiatives or policies or everything have impacted that community, whether it's negative or positive, and they, I don't think our island communities will accept to take the box exercise because of this bill. Clear warning, Mike. Do you want to? Uh... I mean, absolutely right. I agree with, with what, what you're saying. And, and, and impact assessments are going to be really the key to all of this because that's the reality rather than a tick box exercise. So you have an impact assessment and you consult people. This is going to cost money. And do you think there's enough money allocated uh, in, in this process? Or will that, um, if it's not allocated in the bill, if you're going to do it properly, it will actually increase the budget, uh, the, the cost to all of those 60 plus government organisations. Any thoughts on that? It will cost money. And I think, I think in terms of, of what we see, um, we've, from our gallon pupils perspective, we highlighted it as a concern about the resourcing. Uh, Sorry, because the, the, the actual resourcing of, of, of the costs of implementation are, are going to be covered later. I think it's okay. really the costing that you're driving at, just to clarify, I hope I'm right, Mike, it's the cost of doing the consultation, setting up the plan that we should be driving at, I think. At yeah, stage. what I was trying to get at was the actual cost of an impact assessment done by the 60 plus, not the, not the government, but the 60 plus organizations that will be involved in this maybe maybe you could uh, you can you could focus on that specific bit and we're kind of come on to the financial costs of of doing all the work that comes out of the islands bill uh, later on so it's really just a question of the consultation and the planning stage at this stage um, does somebody want uh, Audrey would you like to lead off on that you know this is one subset of a, a range of discussions that, that we have in local authorities and in public sector bodies. So I think it's about the alignment, the principles, the culture of taking you know, um, into account the needs and wants of our island communities. And I wonder at the end of the day if in all of the island or mainland island authorities, the requirements of the impact assessments will be very far away from what we do at the moment because clearly our island community is very important to us, you know, very vocal, um, lots of social capital. So they're very much part of the fabric of what we do. So in terms of considering them, um, it will be interesting to see how much more is required. John, do you want to push that a bit more? Or, or you, I mean, we are going to cover finance of, of the costs of it later. Very important okay. aspect of this. I know John wanted to do. Uh, we're going to come back to that. Can we, can we, John? You had some more questions, I think, on that on on the island proofing. Firstly, just as we're speaking, we're using two phrases here: one being island proofing and one being island impact assessment. And I just wonder if the two are the same. I mean, if my jacket's waterproof, that suggests no water will get through. Um, An island proofing suggests that people on the islands will have exactly the same services as everybody else, whereas an impact assessment suggests to me more. Um, we're going to think about it, we're maybe going to try and work around it, but you'll n actually never have the same. If you're on an island, you're always going to be a bit different from if you're on the mainland. Is that, is that a fair thinking? Andrew? Absolutely. And I would compare it to, to equalities. The important thing is that you've thought about the needs of islands when you're developing policy and, 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 and implementing policy. Um, it doesn't need, mean to say that... Um, you have to do what the islands might want because clearly you will have competing issues and you know within North Ayrshire for example our biggest areas of deprivation are not in the islands but you have to have thought about the needs of islands and that as you say is, is, is impact assessment. Um, okay Fergus. I would, I mean, I would, I would agree in, with, with what he's just said there um, I don't really have anything more to add to it. Uh, point that I wanted to raise at this stage was um, 
ministerial guidance um, where you know, discussed what should be in the plan, what shouldn't be in the plan. So again, the question really, what should be in the ministerial guidance about island proofing? Do we think, do, do we feel that that wants to, should be quite prescriptive? And there's therefore a lot coming from the centre as to both how councils should operate, but other public authorities as well. Or sh should it be more flexible just because the islands are so different? Andrew, do you want to go on that? I think subsidiarity is the key principle. Subsidiarity and empowering islands and communities, but clearly there has to be have to be certain minimum standards to ensure that all public agencies have regard to the needs of islands. So, um, probably I think those those I would address it from those principles really. Audrey, Audrey, do you want to? No, I think I would agree with that. I think um, it's back to the, the question that Jamie asked. We need to inspire confidence in our island communities that there's sufficient in this bill to make a difference to them. So it's that balance between what sits above and you know what's fed from below. And I think that would be a delicate balance to achieve. OK, I'm, going, I'm just going to bring back in Mike, if I may, on a point, and then, then I'm going to bring Jamie back in, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next section. Yeah, it's, it's just following the point that John asked <clears throat> and, and, and the response. <clears throat> in many, many bills and guidance issued by government over the years, it always says, have regard to. That's, that's the point. I mean, if, you put, if the government says you must have regard to, you've just got to show that you have regard to. I think John's question was basically, um, should the government, in its, in its uh, advice to the 60-odd public bodies, should it be more prescriptive to say that if you are going to island-proof, then you need to do it in this particular way? Or... Do we just revert to have regard to, which is basically, you can do anything you like. That's, that's the point. The key is going to be in the guidance the government gives to those 60 public bodies. And is it, it, should it be prescriptive, and this is how you should do it, or should it just be, or you should have regard to? I'm going to let one person come back in on that, um, and Audrey is looking as if she wants to lead on that. I think there's a distinction between having regard to and having due regard to and how, how far that might go. Um, but certainly, again, to inspire confidence in our island communities and, again, um, to assure them that we're serious about this, then their expectation is that... I would hesitate to use the word prescription, but certainly we would like to inspire confidence that this is going to make a difference. Jamie, I can bring you in very quickly. Uh, thank, thank you, Kavir. It's very relevant to what Mike's just said. Uh, in part three of the bill, uh, section seven, uh, there's only one sentence regarding island proofing. It just says, the relevant authority must have regard to island communities in carrying out its functions. So is it really island proofing? Uh, is this bill going far enough to island proof policy? As a local authority, for example, uh, I deal with a tremendous amount of casework from Aaron people who are struggling to access services in the mainland, for example. Does this bill island-proof those public services? I'm going to let one person come back on that. I, I don't know who'd like to do that. Andrew. I, I suppose the model is equalities. Um, in, in the same way as equalities forces people to have regard to the needs of protected characteristics, this should be, do the same for islands. And, and it's worked for, island, for equalities groups, therefore have no reason to believe it won't work for islands. OK, I'm going to move on to the next bit, uh, which is going to be led by Rona. Just a, a really quick question about constituency boundaries. Um, you'll see the bill protects the Western Isles constituency boundary in the same way as Orkney and Shetland are already protected. Do you have any issues with that, or are you quite happy that that has happened in the bill? of our island communities as they would like to support our island colleagues and their aspirations. Okay. No. That's the same from, from Argyll and Butte as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rhoda, I think uh, we'll just move on, if we may, to the next bit, which is going to be led by Richard. Yes. Uh, <coughs> good morning, panel. The 2004 Act, Local Government Act brought in uh, multi-member wards, three and four member wards. Um, the bill provides it the flexibility to recommend to the Scottish Minister to propose electoral wards of one or two councillors to be created covering 
populated islands only. I've got a couple of questions in regard to that. What would you say was the practical issues that current three, four member wards create and what's the impact of switching to a one, two member ward would be? And do you feel this proposal would mean for the overall work of councillors in local authority area? And how would this work? Should candidates reside on the island only? And how do we ensure that that happens? Um, who'd like to lead off quite a complex uh, series of questions? Andrew. And certainly lead off from a North Ayrshire point of view. I, I think what a number of our island communities and councillors have, have, have said to us is that um, if you don't live in the island, then once the ferries go off, uh, you have difficulty in knowing what, what happens during the evening. And so many community groups and meetings happen in the evening that if you don't reside in that island, it's quite difficult to, to keep in, in touch with, with what is happening. Um, unless you're consistently staying on the island. And then, of course, you have the issue of the ferries going off occasionally and so on. Um, and, and, for example, if there's a civil emergency, as there was in Arran a few, few years ago, with the whole island shut down uh, after a snowstorm, your member might not necessarily be on the island to support the community. So I think it's that issue about members not residing on the island um, is, is the key issue. Um, as regards the, the impact in, in North Ayrshire, there is a specific issue we have with the bill, I'm afraid to say. Um, the bill clearly amends the provision which provides that there can be wards of one or two members, but it doesn't amend the provision in the Local Government Act, which provides that um, essentially there has to be a ratio uh, across the entire local authority area of electorate to a, to, to a councillor. So, for example, in North Ayrshire, uh, the current ratio is, is 3,000 electorate per councillor. Uh, once the bill is implemented, that would remain the same. So, in other words, for Arran, um, who have a population of about 3,800, we'd end up with one councillor compared to the two resident councillors they currently have, Cumbria with a population of 1,100. Um, we would end up with no councillors. So, for example, uh, had Cumbria been located within um, Western Isles or Orkney or so on, uh, with a co their quota of, of 800, they would have ended up. Um, pardon me. They would have ended up with with a with their own individual ward. And I think it's important to recall that probably the change, uh, this change, was driven obviously originally by the Arne community meeting with Derek Mackay at the time and included that in, in the consultation paper. And I suspect the Arne community um, probably will be surprised to learn that the impact is actually the number of resident members they have ends up being reduced from, from two to one. So I think, as will be ob obvious probably from our consultation response when it comes, we think the provision in the Local Government Act needs to be changed to allow the Boundaries Commission to be able to set a different ratio for individual islands from the mainland of an authority. I was a councillor, I found that the Boundary Commission could do what it wanted to do uh, and, and never listened to, to what we wanted it to do. But basically, I'll go away from that. Um, when we talk about local members, and, and, and you know, I know you said two, should it be two for each island or should it be one? Uh, or, and the other one, uh, a question I'd like to ask is, when we talk about uh, the consultation war sizes structure, do you think the islands should have their own, I don't know if your council has area committees um, or, or local decisions, no, we're talking about relating uh, decisions back to the islands and, and making people feel as though that they're part of the system. So should the islands have a, a local area committee uh, uh, that is uh, the, the two, possibly two, local area, uh, local island councillors are on, plus other people? I guess to answer that, just to give you, Andrew, a chance just to, to recover your voice for a minute. Uh, Fergus. Well, yeah, I mean, th this was a, a, an area of intense debate amongst the island communities about... Um, the merits of, of, of island councillors or not, and very mixed views. I think there was very strong feeling that, that island communities need, need strong representation. 
that, that was a definite. But the, the situation is at the moment, we have four area committees at the moment split on a geographical split, some with islands, some that don't. And at the moment, there's like 14 councillors in Argyll and Butte with island interests or multi, due to the multi-board system. If it went through this kind of proposal in the bill, it would mean maybe there's only seven councillors out of the 33 or so that would have actually have direct island interests. So there was a concern would that actually be counterproductive? Although there's a recognition that those councillors would concentrate on island issues and not have to take into mainland issues. But then there was another big feeling that was that it was actually good that councillors, even if they're on the mainland and are representing an island, if they have a strong connection to that island, can actually smooth between the two communities, the concerns and the issues faced by these communities. Um, so there's real kind of strong support for, for, for that being recognised. To have an islands only area committee in Argyll and Butte, I think would be impossible to, to do because it's going from Butte to Tyree to Collinsey. They've got massively different issues. And, we, and I know there's cross issues and there's common issues, but when we mapped what the issues were of different communities, it's incredibly diverse what the issues were. And, and some islands suffering from major depopulation, others dealing with tourism booms, others. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's workable. Just the, the message would say it's very complex and, and, and the island, the, the islanders were very wary that, that there could be unintended consequences of it, whatever changes are, and, and, and maybe um, it was um, something that has to be taken forward very carefully. Bring, bring in John and then maybe get the other two panel members to... to yeah, so tied in with what uh, the, the kind of line of our questioning there and, and what Fergus Murray just said. I mean, would there, is there the potential too for a little bit of tension between mainland councillors and island councillors if the mainland councillor, if the island councillor say is, is covering 3,000 people in a relatively compact geographical area, a mainland councillor is trying to cover effectively 12,000 because it's a multi-member ward over a very spread out area. Does that create an inconsistency there that might be resented? I, I, I wouldn't know, use the, the term resented. There's tensions of it and, and the practicalities of representing areas. We had the debate when the Boundaries Commission was considering changes in Argyll and Butte to, to do with our, our sparsity of population. The size of area was enormous and dealing with potentially maybe up to 26 community councils. How does a member get round, go and attend these community councils. And, and when you throw in an island dynamic of having to stay over and stuff, it, it, it becomes extremely difficult. I, am, I think there's, the, there's recognition locally, there's need for tweaking in terms of that there's some island groups that have no representation and there's need for tweaking, but there's not a need to reinvent the entire wheel in terms of dealing with the democratic representation in the Argyll and Butte area. Um, I don't know. If uh, Andrew or do you want to add something briefly to that but there, there is another couple of areas I'd like to move on to so if there's something brief you'd like to add to that very happy to take it I think the one question that has not been answered you know and, and you touched on it slightly Fergus was should the number if we do have island councillors should the number of councils councillors go up in a, in a, a council area um, I think I think there's potential for the, the council, uh, council numbers to increase to ensure that there's valid rep representation in certain areas. Um, I think the communities were very wary if there was island councillors go up, does that impact there's less in the mainland? What would the implications would be given the size of geography that we have? It is challenging for councils, especially in Lorne, for example, they've got 16 community councils to get around. And that's a challenge for any councillor. Andrew, do you want to...? I, th I think there are always are tensions to a certain extent. So, for example, in North Ayrshire, with a single quota of 3,000 per councillor, you know, members in the mainland, um, they have a much smaller area uh, geographically to represent, but th they might have huge areas of deprivation, whereas the member you know, who represents Adrosan and Arran finds themselves representing a huge area of rurality, which isn't taken account in their quota. So I think those tensions exist already. Um, I, and 
I think the key really to the changes is, is to allow the Boundary Commission to set different quotas uh, which try to meet the aspiration that island communities can have their, their, own, their, own, their own ward. And whether that's one or two members, I think boils down to sheer numbers. Okay, thank you. I think we'll just move on, if we may, to, to the next topic. Peter, I think you're going to lead on that. Yeah, thank you, convener, and good morning, folks. Um, I'm going to explore a wee bit about the marine development uh, provision that's in, in the bill. Uh, you know, that the bill provides a regulation making power for Scottish ministers to establish a marine licensing scheme for development activities within Scottish island marine areas. And this would require a person to obtain a license granted by a local authority. And, and do, you, do you, as representing local authorities, agree with this regulation making power? Uh, and how do you feel it could be used in practice? Um, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, Audrey, do you want to, to go on that? Yeah, um, this is obviously a very powerful issue in, in the islands. We're in a slightly, um, I suppose, strange position in as much as Cumbria is two miles away from the mainland. So the idea of the 12 nautical mile zone and the, the discussion around how that might work has certainly been key for us. Um, from a local authority perspective, I think, again, the devil is in the detail. I think uh, the clarity at the moment of the relationship between, for example, the National Marine Plan in from a North Asia perspective, we also are part of the Clyde Marine Plan, so the Regional Marine Plan. Um, we clearly have many interest groups in and around the islands. We have specific roles for the local authorities. So for us, it's the interface among each of these organisations and approaches, which will be key, I think, to making that definitive, um, I, I guess, agreement as to whether or not this is a good or a bad thing. Again, co-production around how you know, we're involved in this and how it works. In terms of the organisational requirements from a local authority, I think these have been addressed separately in terms of the recognition that it will take additional resources, for example, for the Marine Licensing Agency. So that, to an extent, I think, has you know, been addressed. But the detail of that isn't clear at all, and I think that's been the message that's come back regularly. We need to understand more about the intention. Fergus, you'd like to come in on that? Yes, I mean, really, I'm, I'm reflecting the kind of views from the Rhode Island residents here in terms of my response. And I think overall, in terms of all the communities that we, we kind of consulted, there was, there was a bit of a general disappointment about the, um, the proposals contained in the bill in terms of the powers. Um, but there are also, um, they were fearful that maybe there, there may be, this is another layer of bureaucracy. Is this another decision-making process that's taken away from communities? So they, they, there was just a bit a lack of knowledge there in terms of um, what it means. And the, the, the added complication from, from Argyll and Butte was the island communities were a bit worried if, if, if what does it mean in terms of would this create inequalities between the remote peninsulas that are nearby with them? What does, is this going to create tensions between communities? So there was just a little bit of apprehension there. And again, the inequalities issue came up very strongly across um, from, from the island communities about what does this mean? And a, and, a, and a recognition that some of the things that was most important to them was left out of it. Did you want to develop that slightly? Well, I mean, I asked the question last Last week, I think, uh, whether fisheries would be involved in it, and the, the, the clear re the response was it's nothing to do with fisheries. You've got to uh, respect marine pr protected areas as well. So there is a, there is a real concern and, uh, you know, as to what it, do it does actually mean in practice. Um, and, I mean, do you, do you feel as, as, uh, that, uh, that you will be looking for these licensing powers? Will you, be, will you be expecting to take these licensing powers when they become available? Uh, Andrew, would you like to comment on that? I suppose I'd probably echo the points made that the devil is in the detail. I'm conscious, of course, the, the resource issue for local authorities, you know, we generally, uh, certainly North Ayrshire doesn't have boats, so, you know, we'd end up having to hire uh, to regulate, so we'd, we'd need to look into a lot of this in depth. Fergus? It's the same from Argyll and Butte in terms of some of the unknowns of what it will mean for us in terms of an authority. Um, it, it, it certainly, it, 
it's not something we would say no to, but we really need to know what the implications are for us and our communities as we consider this. Um, you have made, done some consultation with your, your island communities, and really the, the, the message that came back is we need to know a lot more about what this actually means, and that you would, you would accept that that's, that's the result of your consultations to, uh, to date. It's very clear, and it will be followed on by what we write to you. Um, it comes across loud and clear, the uncertainty. The genuine issue about inequalities, what does it mean, and, and, and everything like that. Audrey, I'm conscious I didn't give you a chance to respond to that, so if you'd like to come in. Thanks, convener. Very briefly, um, I was only going to introduce the issue of proportionality in terms of the, the licensing approach. So for an authority like North Ayrshire, where, and we've reviewed this with our colleagues in planning, um, the number of related discussions and applications may at times be relatively small. So um, would there be an approach which perhaps took a regional approach to this as opposed to necessarily a single authority approach? And that's something that has come up in discussions, you know, internally and with our community. So it may be worth considering. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to John for the final section. The final area, as usual, is the financial memorandum. Uh, so I'm really just wondering in the first place if you feel the administrative costs which are mentioned in the financial memorandum are realistic, and then especially perhaps between different kinds of authorities, um, would they all be the same or would they be very different, different from each other? Um, Audrey. Again, as Fergus said earlier, our written response will, will go into this in more detail. I do think there may be a distinction between authorities with islands and island authorities. Um, and it's not that there's less of a focus, I would suggest, on islands um, within our own authority. However, I do think that probably the proportion of officer time which will now require to be spent um, on island matters, including the impact assessments, etc., um, may be proportionately greater in the early stages. And that's not to suggest that the culture and the ethos isn't there, but I think um, there certainly could be a question around that. So we would suggest that it's possibly light on that. Focus. Yes, I, mean, I think um, in the past we've, we've got clear concerns about in terms of the resource potential impact on, on the authority. Um, and I think that's, that's it's kind of based on, a, a, it's a bit of an unknown in terms of we're struggling to find out in terms of the number of licenses issued and, and the costs of doing this and everything. We are very resource challenged at the moment. And um, I think anything, anything that comes and maybe adds to the, the resource issues that we have is of concern to the authority. John. I, mean, I think it's said in the financial memorandum that Shetland only has seven licenses per year, which suggests not very many. But, but there's, I mean, a dramatic difference in the amount of fees that could be charged from, I think it's £57 at the bottom to 33000 at the top. Um, so, I mean, I just I kind of struggle to, to know if these are realistic figures. And I, I know the point just made about maybe a regional approach. Uh, any thoughts specifically on the marine, marine licences? Andrew, do you want to...? I suppose, other than probably this... This discussion very much emphasises we are at the start of the journey, and that's really what the, you know, the national plan and the the, the impact the islands proofing is is about. It's the start of the journey, um, and it is it's quite difficult to quantify what the costs are. But obviously, I would echo uh, Fergus's comments that you know these cash-strapped times with matters probably getting even worse. Um, that there are no new resources available. Um, and it talks to you about with Marine Scotland, because people would still need uh, to apply to Marine Scotland as well as to the local authority. Do you think it's, is the potential for uh, the local authority and Marine Scotland to work together on these? Or have you not got that far yet? <laughs> got that far. Okay, I, I think fair. there ultimately is. I think it's fair to say that certainly in North Ayrshire, our, our island communities want more control. Uh, you know, th their concern is about, I suppose, their, their issues particularly national bodies not having regard to it. So from their point of view, anything that brings control local, more locally is, is better. But clearly that has to be balanced against issues of, of cost and, and resource and efficiency. 
Um, just, just before, I'd, I'd like to just ask a question myself at the end of this, is, is that we, we're coming up with island plans, and we're, we're told they're not going to cost very much for the, for the inhabited islands, um, considering the amount of money that we've got. But we've come up with a plan, and we're going to make islands island-proofed uh, against uh, future things that may go against them. Are you concerned about the costs of actually delivering the island proofing and who's actually going to meet that cost or are you relatively relaxed that that's all going to come as part of this bill from central government? Fergus, do you want to...? Well, I, I think we're very much concerned about what it, what it is. If it's some good, in terms of a meaningful plan that addresses the issues that islanders want to see addressed, it must have resource implications and I, I think the authority and even, even the island um, um, constituents have got a concern where would those resources come from and, and would it impact on other aspects of our communities. Andrew, do you want to...? I think we're probably more relaxed with the high level principles of the bill because it fits within probably what we've been trying to do in North Ayrshire in terms of locality planning. If the bill hadn't been here, we'd have been on that journey anyway, to be frank but the devil will be in the detail going forward. Audrey. Yes, I think it goes back to, to Jamie's point. Um, we're all here to do the very best we can for all of our residents, um, whether they live in an island or not. Mainly the issues around the work that we do with our island communities um, are resource-based. There's no doubt about it. And... That's to do with proportionality, it's to do with access to specialist services, which are expensive. Um, it's to do with things that cost money. So in order for us to, to make the greatest difference to our island communities, resources have to be considered. OK, thank you. That's probably a, a good place to draw this to a close. Audrey, I'd like to thank you for coming, Andrea and Fergus, and, and giving evidence uh, to, to us on this very important bill. I'm now going to briefly suspend the meeting uh, to allow witnesses to change. Thank you again for your time.
Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now resume our meeting uh, on agenda item two, which is evidence on the Islands Scotland Bill. And I'd like to welcome our second panel, uh, Stuart Black from the, the Director of Development and Strategic Trans Transportation from the Highland Council, and Norma MacDonald, convener, and Malcolm Burr, the Chief Executive from the Western Isles. Thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, the first question will be uh, led off by John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, and uh, I'm going to kick off with the same series of questions as I did last time uh, with, with the previous panel. I know two of you were present. And that is whether the overall intent of the bill matches expectations. Malcolm. Yes, I think it does. You will, have, you will have noted in our submission there are a few points of detail, uh, particularly on island proofing, which, which we would like to see uh, clarified, uh, to say the least. But... In general, this is an enabling bill. This forms part, we would say, of the community empowerment agenda. It indeed forms part of the review of local governance agenda. But most importantly, uh, it, it, it's an element, it's a key element of the campaign which, with Orkney and Shetland, uh, our islands are future, which is really about uh, ensuring perhaps that the islands have as level a playing field as possible, that, that structural disadvantage is diminished, uh, and that at this time of change in public sector delivery and indeed in, in public sector structures, that the islands have their, have their place and have a, clear, uh, have a clear place at the table, that our needs are recognised, and that there are the appropriate administrative and political um, mechanisms in place to, to make sure that's, that, that, that comes about. Stuart, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I think from Highland Council point of view, obviously our islands are a smaller part of the total population. They're about 5% um, or thereby of the total population of Highland. Yeah. But they are very important to us, particularly in the promotion of Gaelic language and culture. Um, so we've, we feel the, the bill does meet the general needs. We have some specific uh, issues around things like availability of broadband and some of the, the services that we'd like to see um, made some sort of universal service obligation type approach that means that we get these uh, things on our island communities as well and they're not the last in line to get some of the, the upgrades in uh, technology. I think another point we make is around um, some of our peninsulas. So places like Noidart and Scorig don't actually have road connections. They are reliant on ferry connections as well. They're obviously not islands, but we do have remote peninsulas that are also significant from a remoteness and geographic point of view. Okay, thank you. Um, John, do you want to come develop that slide. Uh, yeah, yes indeed and, and is, is your expectation this will lead to greater empowerment for island communities? I know we'll pick up on issues perhaps later colleagues um, uh, Stuart about uh, other areas but with our island communities do you imagine this will lead to greater empowerment? Uh, yeah Norman sorry. Thank you, Convener. Uh, we absolutely believe it will mean greater empowerment for island communities, and, and we're very strongly of the view that it is not about empowering our island local authorities. It's about us and then, with that empowerment, um, uh, sending that out into communities. And, and that, is, that is our starting point, that we are looking to, to have powers and the ability to make our own decisions on a whole series of issues that impact on us, that don't impact on mainland authorities, uh, that we are, have the tools at our disposal to be able to influence them in a positive way. We are not looking for equality with other mainland authorities or mainland areas. We know that's not possible. What we want to do is diminish the negative impact, and that is why island proofing is such an important part of this bill. It, is a, it started off as initially that, that if agencies island proof their, their uh, legislation and policies and the implementation of both of them, that we would end up in a much better place and that we wouldn't have to spend so much effort, time and money trying to retrofix unintended consequences of legislation and policies that have an adverse impact on our communities. So we don't see this as, as a case of island authorities being empowered. We will look to empower our communities much more so than we're able to do at the moment because we don't have these levers at our disposal. Okay. Uh, John, do you want to...? 
Stuart, by acknowledging it is a smaller percentage of the population, um, do you see your island communities being empowered by as a result of this? With, within the Highland Council, we're obviously a very large council. We cover 31% of the landmass of Scotland. But we do have a series of local committees, and we have the Sky and Razi Committee, which is quite a powerful voice for, for that community. Obviously, we have areas like the Small Isles as well, as part of Loch Aber. So I think a lot of this is around, as, as Norman has said, it's around empowering the communities at the grassroots rather than just in the local authority. And we've got good examples. The Island of Egg, for example, is, is a really good example of a community that's uh, taken things into its own hand, helping shape its own future from a very troubled past. So we've got good examples of where communities have been empowered and can bring forward development. And I think the spirit of this bill is to see more of that activity. That. And, and, and finally, just to, to, to yourself, Mr Black, there, and, and it is about uh, the difference between the, 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 the three uh, island authorities and the mainland authorities who have inhabited islands. It, these authorities, the, the mainland authorities, enter this process later in the day. Has that been a problem, or do, are you happy with the level of engagement? Do you feel fully engaged now? That's right. We did uh, come a bit late to the, the party, but we feel very engaged now. Uh, we've been taking part in the discussions through the Islands Grouping, chaired by uh, Mr Yusuf, and we've been party to discussions recently. Uh, we were across with the council leader in, in Lewis, so we do feel part of it. It's obviously slightly different having a smaller proportion of population on islands, but as I mentioned, there are some remote geographies in, in the Highland area that have island-like characteristics, so it is important that council like ours is involved. Um, John, can I bring Gail in? Because I, I, I know this is an area that she, she has a question in before I go to Radio. So, Gail. Um, yeah, my question. Oh, good morning, panel. Sorry, first of all. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is just to follow on from um, what Stuart Black said there just now. In the Highland Council evidence on page 134, you do touch on um, the ensure there are more general rural, rural proofing of policies and legislation for not just island communities. And I wonder if you have any opinion on whether or not the island proofing will have knock-on effects, positive effects for more rural and remote communities on the mainland. Certainly, it would be good to see that. I think many communities are facing challenges, particularly remote or rural communities, and those aren't necessarily addressed through a particular piece of legislation. But if the spirit of, of this bill is to look at remote areas and consider that they need additional protection, then I think that's a positive for the wider Highland area. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can comment on, on that. I, I, my interpretation would be it's an islands bill, but, but I understand your sentiments. Rhoda, could I bring you in there, please? Yes, can I ask about the challenges um, faced by islands authorities and uh, authorities with islands, and making the distinction between the two? Are they different? Is the expectation of the islands different, depending on the makeup of the authority they're part of? Who'd like to... Uh, Malcolm, is that you? I suppose they are inevitably different just because of the political structures. I mean, our, our islands councils, I like to believe, and I have worked in, in two of them, um, are quite different in, in this respect, that as well as being providers of statutory services, uh, there is an expectation of what I would call community leadership. I don't pretend for one moment that everybody loves their local authority uh, at every moment, but there is an expectation that the council will act as external advocate for the area, that, that the council will take on issues which are absolutely not within its statutory responsibility, such as ferries, such as air travel, such as health boards. There is very much that special role, and it's a privilege, I think, to work in that, in that environment. I, I couldn't say uh, to what extent that, that, uh, that, that applies in, in, in other areas, but uh, I think islands councils are quite distinctive, and, and that is why we, we began the campaign as the three islands councils, but it was always very much on the basis that anything we achieved would be uh, almost certainly of benefit to other islands, to councils with islands, and I, I take uh, I take Ms. Ross's point on on uh, remote rural communities. That the same principles I think apply, and the same benefits uh, and achievements can equally be applied to, to many other areas of rural Scotland. Uh. I don't think it's too much, so much about expectations. I think it's about fairness. So there are disadvantages that island communities have. For example, additional charges that are put on deliveries from uh, 
companies that uh, you know mail order and things like that. So I, I think it's about fairness and it's about having a, a reasonable level, level playing field. People with, on islands expect that transport costs are going to be higher, but they don't expect to be penalised for it. Um, by the way that some companies do. So, so I think it is about fairness. I think islands do have a special identity as well that is possibly different from some mainland communities, although in rural communities you do have strong identities, and that, you know, so it's not always quite as black and white. But I do think it's, it's about fairness, it's about um, equality of treatment, and it's about making sure that island communities have a voice. And they've felt, I think, for many years that they don't have a sufficient voice. And, and Stuart, I'm just going to say before I bring Norman in, I'm sure all the people across the islands have views about delivery charges because it's not just people on islands who suffer from them. Norman, if I may, and then I'll go back to, to Rhoda. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think uh, the, the point that uh, uh, Ms Grant raised it is very relevant and I think there are great similarities between island authorities and island communities that aren't part of mainland authorities and the ones, the ones that are part of mainland authorities. They, ha they very much have the same issues. We have the same issues even within our islands where people who are removed from what is perceived to be the centre of power, as it were, you know, where, where the, the mass of the population is, they feel that they are worse off than, than, um, than those are at the centre. The same would apply to uh, local authorities that have islands uh, as part of their authority. The same feelings uh, exist there. And it is about reducing these inequalities. It is about uh, having a degree of fairness. And it's about making uh, particularly public agencies think hard before they Im implement uh, legislation and policies that are going to exacerbate these inequalities and and I think that is the fundamental pl uh, plank of this legislation and it is one of the key things that people are looking for and I think our communities are beginning to understand that and they're beginning to understand that that is important for them going forward. Rhoda, do you want to... Does that make it easier for wholly island authorities to implement the bill and meet the aspirations of their communities? And I suppose the example I would use, like if you're a mainland authority with islands, if you look at things like decisions over the marine environment, it must be quite difficult to have your islands have that power as a local authority, but for you as a local authority not to have those powers over the rest of your area. Is there things like that that would make it easier for Holy Island authorities to implement and meet the aspirations of the bill? Or do you think that will happen regardless? I think the marine, uh, the marine part of the bill is, is in line with uh, some, the devolution of Crown Estate from the UK government to the Scottish government and hopefully down into communities as well. And, and the, the two things, uh, uh, we believe, go, go together in that, in that respect. And I don't think that makes any difference whether, whether, uh, whether it's a Holy Island authority or an authority that has islands that have a marine environment that they can, that can make use of. Uh, to support their community, I don't think it makes a, a huge difference at all. I think the same applies across across the board, where there, there is the opportunity for com small communities, remote communities uh, in peninsulas, as Stuart mentioned earlier, for them to, to, to take greater control of the marine assets, as many of have, them have done through land reform with the land-based assets. And again, we have great confidence in, in the capacity of our communities right across the highlands and islands to take control of land-based assets and manage them effectively for the benefit of their community. And we see this as a natural progression of that. And I think that's why these discussions came up as part of, as part of the islands, our islands of future and, and the, the islands bill. Um. Stuart nodded, so I, I, I was sort of assuming that, that he was in agreement and, and wasn't going to speak against what Norman said. I, I think just to confirm that communities that have coasts are very interested in what happens, whether they're islands or not. And I think the spirit of this bill does apply right across the, the authorities with islands as much as the island authorities. So I think the coastal elements, the Highland Council certainly campaigned a lot around the Crown Estate and devolution of Crown Estate um, assets. So I would concur with what Norman had said. We spoke to the previous panel about Our Islands, Our Future, and it 
how this was driven by the three main island authorities and the mainland authorities with islands kind of came to the table later on. Um, they give us a variety of reasons for that. Um, I suppose what I'm asking is, what are your, what's your thoughts about why that was and was there a disadvantage at coming to this later on in the process? For the, for Stuart, the I'm going to bring you in uh, very briefly, if I may. Um, I don't think there was a particular disadvantage. I can understand why the island authorities work together. I think we've always had a strong partnership across highlands and islands, and certainly authorities like ourselves, Argyll Island, Butte, North Ayrshire, our islands are, uh, I guess, more important than their population size to our local authorities, so they certainly punch above their weight. So I, I don't think it's a disadvantage, but I do think we can help with some areas of activity around some of the lobbying. City region deals and island deals, for example, have similar aspirations, so we've tried to assist there. So I think, although we're a bit late to the party, I think we're, we're very much playing a, a role in it. Mr Niles, um, being kind of one of the forerun, well, the leaders in, in this process with the other island authorities, does the bill meet your aspirations when you set out on our islands, our future? Uh, uh, I don't know who's going to answer that, Malcolm. If, it, if it's you, could I ask you to, to, to keep it as brief on that one as possible, please? I, I would say from a, from a chief executive perspective, it is a very important part of the set of aspirations which the campaign uh, has, has set out to achieve. But there, are, there are other elements to that. One is we hope for an islands deal with UK and Scottish governments. Um, there are other um, adjustments that have been made to how business is done to accommodate islands, but this is a very important part of it. And in, in terms of island proofing and the National Islands Plan, uh, these, are key, these were key uh, points which we wish to see uh, enacted in legislation and hopefully they will be. That probably leads us neatly on to the next section which will be led by, by, by Jamie. Thank you convener, good morning panel. Um, can I just touch on something that was said in the last uh, few questions and apologies it was either Malcolm or Norman who said it but the bill will empower island communities not island authorities. Uh, was, it, was it yourself? That said that. Can, said that. Can, I, can I probe a little bit further on that? I'm, I'm intrigued by that phrase. How does the bill in its current form enable island communities in terms of the technicality of the bill? How does it physically enable I think, island I communities? I think, as, as was mentioned early in the session earlier on, I think there are a number of things we would like to see on the face of the bill that are of key importance to island communities in particular in relation to connectivity. And these are some of the things that we would want to see there, both in terms of digital connectivity and also uh, transport connectivity. These are, these are two fundamental things for island communities, but there are also issues we recognise for peninsulas that are dependent on similar connections to, to central population and services. Uh, so so there, are, there are a number of things we would like to see on the face of the bill, but we recognise that the bill is, is a permissive bill, and we would expect within the plan and the guidance that goes with the, the bill that there will be significant discussion about, about the specifics. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why we are comfortable with that is that, as has been said many times, one size does not fit all. Even within our island's authority, one size does not fit all. So it's very difficult to be prescriptive you know, on the face of the bill about some of these issues other than the principles. And we, we expect and we're, we, we're optimistic, more than optimistic, that that dialogue will happen as the process goes on. So at the moment, the, uh, the bill only states that the minister must uh, produce an island, a national islands plan and present that uh, to parliament. Um, is it your view that the bill itself should be more prescriptive? In other words, it should dictate some elements of what should be in that plan that's currently not in the bill? Uh, Malcolm, I'll come to you and then I'll come to Stuart if I may. I think we see the plan as absolutely critical because it, it, it should put the meat on the bones, as it were. Um, the, the reason we're, we haven't absolutely stated in our response that it should be prescriptive is that it's that we hope that the plan will be there for all time. It will obviously change from time to time, we hope, 
and that's an important qualification we would like to insert, that, that it will be a national plan fully consulted uh, with and negotiated with uh, the island's authorities and other, and other local authorities and indeed communities. Uh, but it is essential, I think, that, there is, uh, that, that the plan be clear, that it be outcome focused, uh, that it be proportionate, because that would recognise that some islands and islands areas and councils with islands may or may not wish to take advantage of all, of all aspects of, of, uh, of certain policy areas. They may, they may want variation and the plan allows for that. One of the models we looked at, um, just for the committee's information, was the National Gaelic Plan, which has a certain proportionality uh, among, among areas, but it sets out very clearly what, uh, what, what is expected in implementing uh, the Gaelic Language Act, and th that's, one of the, that's one of the models um, we looked at. But I think, uh, in the immediate term, we would expect to see a great deal in the plan about connectivity, about public service reform, uh, and about transport, to name just three. But, but the plan is, is critical. It, is the, it, it provides the substance uh, behind the enabling provisions of this, of this bill. Stuart, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I, I think just in terms of the Highland Council view, certainly the importance of the islands plan will be significant. I, I think there have been issues around tourism, for example, this year, where we've seen significant growth in tourism. We want to see that um, continue. We want to be able to maintain a strong and healthy economy in our, in our island communities. So a strong focus on the economy within the islands plan would be welcome. I think, as, as has been mentioned, the guidance that comes with the bill as well is also really going to be where the, the detail is. and and that will put the meat on the bones of the legislation. But generally, uh, we welcome it as a piece of permissive legislation, but it's really depending on what happens next. And the plan also should be measurable so that we can tell how well things are progressing. If, if it's a, a vague plan, doesn't have targets, then we won't really be able to measure how successful it is. So we would like to see some, some targets in it that, that uh, public bodies and others can be held to account if those aren't met. Jamie, do you want to come back? My, my worry is that there's a lot of hope and expectation in, in what you're saying and the things that you hope that the bill will, uh, sorry, the plan will address, things that you, you hope will be in the plan and <coughs> outcomes and objectives that you, you hope will be in the plan. Uh, but there's absolutely no uh, mandatory duty to have any of those in the plan in the, as it currently stands in the bill. It just says that the minister should produce a plan. Um, and that leads on to, I guess, a, a final question in, in, in the sense that who should the minister consult? to create that plan. Again, it's, it's quite loose in the wording in, in the current draft of the bill. It says the minister must consult such persons as they consider represent the interests of island communities, which again is quite open and some criticism has been that it doesn't put any statutory duty on the minister to consult islanders themselves or any specific groups within the island communities. Do you have any views on that? Norman, you'd like to come in on that. Uh, thank you, Camino. I, I think in, in terms of the comments that it's, it's about hope and expectation, I think it's about a belief, a very clear belief based on quite strong messaging uh, from our own communities and from the wider community about, about uh, the potential for, uh, for communities to, to change the way we as local authorities go about our business and government generally goes about its business in respect of island communities. And I think, and I think that is a growing, it is a growing belief. And we have examples, you know, as we mentioned earlier in terms of, in terms of the land reform legislation and the empowerment, <coughs> community empowerment legislation that gives communities, irrespective, irrespective of the islands bill, it gives uh, it gives power into, into communities for them to be able to have a greater influence over the things that impact on their lives, either adversely or positively. So, so, so there, is, there, is, um, there is an expectation you know, as part of the pr process, and that will be co-production, as has been the case to date with the bill. It started off with three island authorities presenting a paper, I think it was to the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, and all the local authorities in the Highlands and Islands strongly supported uh, the, the way in which it was going to be taken forward. And since then, we've had nothing but, uh, but positive engagement with our own communities and with communities elsewhere in the Highlands and Islands and with government as well. So, so it's more an expectation for us at this stage, uh, but there are things we would want to see absolutely nailed down either on the face of the bill or in the plan and, and the guidance that goes with it. Before I bring anyone else in, I, I know 
uh, the deputy convener's got some questions on consultation, but there's quite a lot of expectation here, and uh, so I'd like to just bring uh, Gail Ross in, if I may, please. Yeah, um, Jamie touched on who should be consulted, and we heard from the previous panel that um, <clears throat> obviously the authorities and community councils, but all the way down to individuals in the community, is really important that they all have a voice. Um, I just want to ask you about the time scale. Uh, the Scottish Government have said that the island plan would be laid before Parliament a year after the Act came into force. Do you think that's realistic? And they also said that there should be a new islands plan every five years. Uh, can you comment on that as well, please? I'm going to bring Malcolm in and then Stuart, and, and I think that will give us the balance, hopefully. So, Malcolm. Th thank you, Convener. Uh, we would like to see a specific provision, uh, obviously, for consultation with the islands councils as the elected representatives of uh, of, of these areas, but also with those bodies which, um, I'm trying to draft legislation here as I speak, but those bodies which represent uh, islands and groups of islands. I'm thinking particularly in our own area of the community land trusts which are elected, uh, particularly about community councils which are uh, often elected, not always, but in some cases following um, competitive election. Uh, and the community development companies, which again have an open membership and are, and are elected by the communities in which they operate. I think there should be a statutory provision uh, requiring consultation with all, all of these bodies. On the timing point, um, we in the Western Isles certainly feel that a year is about right because we have been preparing for this, we like to think, for a long time and we have lots to put in an island's plan if an invitation were extended to us tomorrow to, to, to draw one up. So I think a year is, is I wouldn't say ambitious, I think it's reasonable. I, I think it's a, it's, a tight time, it's a tight time scale for, to allow the relevant consultation, but it is reasonable and we would, we would support that. As regards the length of the plan, I think that's very much uh, in the eye of the beholder. I think the first one should perhaps stretch beyond the lifetime of this parliament and then perhaps be on a five-yearly basis, but um, I don't think we hold, we hold particularly strong views on that point, except that it should be for a reasonable length of time. Stuart. Uh, in terms of consultation, I think acts like the Community Empowerment Act do set the scene for local consultation. I think achieving it will be challenging. They'll have to use uh, internet and other types of consultation. I think getting around all of the islands would be would be difficult, but that, that modern technology does enable that um, to happen. I think in terms of setting a, a timescale of one year after the Act, as um, Malcolm has mentioned, there's there's quite a bit of local work. Places like Skye and Razi, the, the Highland Council does have local priorities that they would fit into a plan like this. I think reviewing every five years, I'm responsible for planning within the Highland Council, um, five years can go quickly, but I think importantly you should review things in the middle to see how you're getting on with progress. I don't think it's right that you have a plan and you only look at it after five years. Things can happen very quickly in, in um, economic developments and, and around uh, decision making, so I think it would be important to have a review process during the course of a five years so that it's not a, d a done and dusted document and then something that's looked at um, five years down the line. So some sort of review in the progress during the course of the plan would be important as well. Okay, we'll probably leave that there and move on to the next bit, which, uh, sorry, Mike, it's you. Ellen Proofing, and I think we're all concerned to make sure that this doesn't become a tick box exercise. So really my question is focused on, could you give me an example of an initiative from any of those 60 public bodies that are mentioned in the, in the bill, which has been island proofed in the past? What was it? How was it done and what did it cost? You may want to gather your thoughts. Uh, Malcolm, do you, do you have an example or, or Norman, do you, I mean? Perhaps start off with um, the so-called bedroom tax, which um, came in very quickly and there was the usual statutory consultation, but had such an effect on on the islands, which in, in, in which the uh, there was this very little one-bedroom accommodation to which um, prospective tenants could move, uh, even if they, even if they were able to. Uh, was such that we had to seek and were granted a derogation. Now that, that I think is a, is a classic example. Had there been a discussion and an engagement uh, with our area, we would have said, you know, we, we appreciate of course the aims of the legislation and the will of parliament, but 
this cannot practically be delivered uh, in our areas. That's, that's the example that comes, comes most quickly to mind. Um, Diamond, please. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. My yeah. question was really, yeah. is there something that has been island proofed in the past? What was it? How much did it cost? I'm thinking prospectively, um, I suppose, looking, that this isn't exactly in point, but I think it's relevant, is the forthcoming review of local governance. Uh, we were pleased to note in the programme for government uh, a reference to island authorities which want to take forward a single public service delivery model uh, will be supported by Scottish Government in so doing, obviously with a number of caveats. I think that is saying public service reform is with us, there will be a local governance bill, but uh, here is a recognition uh, of what Islands Councils and others have been saying for some time, and perhaps government is preparing for that, um, or at least allowing the possibility of other models. That, that is the kind of thing I think we're, we're talking about here. I mean, on that. I think um, Mr. Rumbles has asked, can I think of an example? And I'm afraid I can't, so I'm going to have to leave it at that. I can't think of one where island proofing has been used in the past. Uh, I think Malcolm was talking about the future as well, mm -hmm. which does illustrate the point, I think, about the importance of the need for island proofing. Mike, do you want to develop that? Um, well, it's interesting that we all, everybody's talking about island proofing, yet nobody really seems to know how it's being to be done and what the cost would be. So that's an interesting question. Could I move on to another question? Um, I'm very interested in the Western Islands uh, written submission. And in it, you say that there is no enforcement provisions listed either in relation to a decision by any of these public bodies not to conduct an impact assessment for this purpose. So you're raising the issue of actually, I'm trying to get really to the nitty gritty about this, about what is island proofing? And if you've got asking these 60 bodies to do island proofing, I'm not sure what, what, what it is and um, the costs involved. And then you're saying actually in your evidence, well actually there's no enforcement provisions to ensure that these 60 bodies do that. These are perhaps convener the improvements that we would like to see uh, in in the bill, but there is there is provision uh, in in the bill that an assessment must have a description of the likely significant different mm -hmm. effect, mm -hmm. and then an assessment. So there is there is a pro there is a two stage process there that a, a government or an authority or an agency must first describe what they're doing. And then, and then assess it. Now that 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 is a very good start. Uh, our, our our issue with that is that that assessment, of course, uh, the way the bill is written at the moment, is solely in the opinion of the authority, which we think um, yeah, leaves a lack of objectivity. That's that's and the assessment of significance is likewise entirely with the reviewing of authority. Mm -hmm. But with with the reviewing authority, we think, of course the best uh, people to assess significance uh, are, those, are those living and representing yeah, island communities, and we would wish to be involved in that process. That should be co-produced. Uh, you asked about cost, though, and I'm sorry I didn't address that. Um, a lot of this work we see, frankly, as part of our day job as government. Uh, you know, we are an arm of government and local government, and we see this... We see this um, <coughs> As, as, part, as, as part of our work with UK government, with Scottish government, um, and with the agencies who, have, who will have to set up administrative means of working with us to talk about forthcoming uh, legislation, policy, and strategy. It's hard to say what the cost will be. I mean, we would, we would willingly do that tomorrow. Uh, and as I say, I see it as part of core business of any okay. of any body which calls itself government. But these, but the two points I've made about the subjectivity uh, of of the need for an assessment and then the assessment of significance are, are key points for us. But there is there is the basis there in the in the bill of a process. Just before I bring in Norman, just so I, so I can under, understand this, that that the assessment goes ahead, and the assessment says that it it doesn't. Uh, island proof the decision yeah. and that to island proof the decision is going to cost money um, because 
decisions to island proof or do anything will, will have a financial effect. I'm just trying to understand where uh, communities think that money will be coming from. Will it be coming from local authorities or government? And how are you going to deal with that? Norman, maybe that's an add-on to, to, to the answer you were going to give, but can I bring you in here, please? Yeah. Well, well in, in, relation to, in relation to the question that was asked by uh, Mr. Rumbles, uh, this is key to making sure that this is not a tick box exercise. Uh, it is absolutely key that, that it, is, it is clear and it is not for the authority to decide whether it is relevant to island proof or not. And, and as, it is very much part of our day job, but we would rather, as local authorities and communities, be having that conversation with agencies before the policy in, is introduced and before the legislation is introduced, if it, if it were to be government. We would want to have that discussion. And it, it actually would save money because it costs more money to retrofix the issue that that uh, that Malcolm raised in relation to the, the bedroom t the bedroom tax, which was a, a totally unintended consequence of of legislation that in other places was quite relevant for some folk, uh, and it's about it's that's where that's where the, um, the work gets done. It is part of the day job, but we would rather be doing that the day before the decisions are taken rather than trying to persuade people to change it afterwards. And, and, and we would want to see the bill strengthened in that respect. It doesn't change it fundamentally because the provisions are there, but it is more specific. And it, we believe it would send out a clear message to those with whom we're engaging that, that there is an onus for them to take it seriously. And, and I think that, that maybe addresses the, the point, Mr. Ramos. To dwell on the, the finance side before I bring Stuart in, or, or you know, who's going to pay for the the the, the island briefing? I, I believe there may, in some instances, be an additional cost to doing to doing that. But I think that cost would be would be much less than trying to fix it afterwards uh, and trying, uh, you know, and it would be for again that would be part of the discussion that would take place. It's easier to get things right before you have to spend a lot of time and energy trying to change things than, than uh, doing it. Um, it's easier doing it at that stage than doing it retrospectively. So, so we don't see that as a huge issue, but that is something that would have to be discussed as part of the process, because if it was something that was ridiculous, you know, in terms of a horrendous c cost, then we, we would have to be reasonable about that. But that would, be, that would be the form of the discussion and the impact assessment that would be made. You know, clearly it's not a blank check that's going to be offered up by anybody in relation to that. I'm going to bring Stuart in and then I'm going to bring... Ju ju uh, a, a small one just providing just, a, just a, very, a, a short very answer. Very quickly. I mean, evidence before was that islanders need to be consulted to make sure it's not a ticket box exercise, but in addition, or, or w would it be uh, sufficient for the councils, the island councils, to be consulted about this before it turns into a, to avoid it being a tick box exercise on an assessment by these 60 bodies? Uh, it, we, would, we, would, we would actually speak to the communities that were most likely to be affected by it. And that can be a community of geography or it could be a community of interest in, term, in terms of, in t you know, in terms of a whole range of services okay. that we provide. But we would not be doing that without consulting with, with the community, absolutely not. But I think the local authorities are one vehicle through which that can be done, or through the IG, IGBs, you know, uh, or whatever the relevant bodies is. But it, what's important is that Thanks, agencies John. don't feel that they can, yeah. they can shy away from responsibility. Great, thank, thank you very much. Stuart. We refer to equality impact assessments where there's a screening process, first of all, to determine whether a full impact assessment is undertaken, and we think that process makes sense. So there'll be some areas where there'll be a requirement for um, a full impact assessment, but not everywhere. And on impact assessments, it, it can be about mitigation as well. There, will be, there could be financial impacts, but there also are things that could be done to reduce the uh, potential impact of a policy. So we, we feel a two-stage process will be beneficial, and that way the public bodies will, will be able to show that they've looked at this issue, and if it requires a full impact assessment, they will do one. And that, and that mirrors um, environmental legislation, equalities legislation. So that's a potential way forward. Okay. Um, John, can I bring you in, and in, unless you feel your question has been answered? Well, we have touched on some of the things I was going to ask, but uh, I, I mean, on the question of an example of what could be island-proofed, I, I mean, the one that comes to my mind is ferries. 
and we were on Mull, which I realise none of you represent. Um, but I think, for example, the community on Mull did not feel they had been consulted about the new ferry timetables. Now, clearly, there's immediately a tension because somebody has to decide where all the ferries are going and every island cannot have exactly what it wants. But I just wonder if that might be the kind of example where, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, and I don't want to go into all the detail, but I mean, potentially, maybe a local community could be a bit more involved in the future than they have been in the past when these kind of uh, decisions are being made. Would, would that be a kind of example? I think that, that that example is quite relevant to the principle that communities and those who represent them should be involved at, at as early as possible a stage and that should be and that requirement should be there in statute to be involved to be involved in decisions which affect them on, on the point of cost just incidentally i mean part of that debate should be whether the same outcome can be achieved in an island by a different means which may well be cost neutral or less or less cost demanding and, and that would be a key part of of that of that kind of discussion, but yes, the, the, the issue is uh, the issue has to be involvement in the decision-making process and in the formation of policy. We're living in an age of significant change to public services, significant change to public service delivery, significant financial uh, constraints. I would suggest, and also regional planning and delivery of services. These are of critical importance to islands, and it's essential that the the statutory element is there to ensure that ensure the involvement of communities and those that represent them in these decisions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stuart, do you want to? No, no, no. Okay, John. And then my brief. other point, just uh, following on a bit from that, I mean, we've already discussed uh, to some extent what, what should be in the bill and what should be in the island's plan. And another aspect to that is ministerial guidance. Uh, how much should be in the ministerial guidance. So can I have any comments or thoughts about what should be in there, how much should be in there in the ministerial guidance, or should we be trying to minimise that and have everything la laid down elsewhere? I'm happy to, happy to start that discussion, convener. I, the ministerial guidance is very, very important because that, that obviously sets out the processes. And this, this is a bill about, about policy formation and process as well as about the substantive elements. I think uh, it's essential that the island's proofing elements are, are set out in sufficient detail about who will be consulted in what form, at what level, what will the sign-off be, what will the discussion be with islands councils and islands communities, and also what the review process will be should an authority say, um, we don't see the need for an impact assessment here and we don't think it will have a significant effect, and there's a, there's a radically different view uh, in Lerwick or Kirkwall or Stornoway. Uh, there needs to be a process of review. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about judicial review, that would be an absolutely last resort, but um, I'm talking about a process which, is, which can be where each party can say, this has been done fairly and reasonably, we won't always agree with the outcome, but we are clear uh, that, a, that a process has been followed which takes into account uh, relevant matters. That, the guidance is, is absolutely essential to that. I mean, on the, on the consulting point, I mean, presumably you wouldn't want to have your hands totally tied by central government as to who you consult on every issue that you, you would hope, as, a, as an island's authority, yes. that diff on different issues you would perhaps slightly different, consult uh, different people. Exactly. As, as Norman has said, you know, we will consult at times internally geographic communities, at times communities of interest, dependent on the, on the subject matter. Come in on that. I just concur with uh, Malcolm around the importance of the guidance because that really sets out what has to be done and the way it should be done. So nothing further to add on that. Okay. The, the next question is Raiders, and, and I'm going to apologise that this is going to go one way only, in the sense that uh, there is an evidence session next week, which, which I believe uh, the West Niles will have input into. But uh, Rhoda, your question. What he's trying to say is the Western Isles shouldn't be answering this question because you'll have adequate time next week. <laughs> um, <laughs> therefore, can I ask Stuart Black if um, Highland Authority is happy with um, the Western Isles having the same protections as Orkney and Shetland with regard to their boundary for elections? The, pan the panel members sitting to your left, I'm sure you, <laughs> you will answer carefully. 
Yes, um, that's interestingly, that's that, that we, we do support that. We also have a concern over, and this was raised at the Council in, in debate, around um, the size of Highland constituencies. So we do feel that that's, that's a significant issue as well. So very, very keen to, and uh, supportive of West Niles, but we also have a concern over the, the size of parliamentary constituencies within the Highland Council area and, and any potential reduction, because they are amongst the biggest of any uh, constituencies anywhere in Europe, is, is my uh, understanding. I'm for getting that in, but I'm afraid that's not covered by the Islands Bill, and, 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 and I don't think we can stretch it that far. I'm going to move on to the, the next section, which, which is to Richard. I, I, I agree with you. The Boundary Commission, uh, to my mind, should uh, look at all these things. Anyway, 2004, there was a change to the multi-member wards, and actually, just before the last election, the Boundary Commission in my area put the number of councillors up by seven, from 70 to 77. Uh, against our recommendation, but hey-ho. Um, only to Highland Council again, because uh, uh, Western Isles will get uh, their a chance next week. Can you, have you any thoughts about the practical issues regarding the current three, four member wards and what impact of switching to a one, two member ward would be for local um, islands? Do you think this proposal would mean an overall number of councillors in a local authority area should go up? And how would this work? And should candidates um, who stand for island uh, constituencies or, or wards stay in the islands? Um, well, this, this was uh, again discussed a bit at the council debate on the islands bill. Um, I think in terms of the representation within the Highland Council, Sky and Razi is a ward and that has four members from it. So they're representing the, the island community there. The uh, issue is probably more pertinent to the small isles, where that's in the Cool and Malig ward. Um, I think we were of the view that there should be a minimum threshold, because these are very small populations on those islands. So nothing really further to add than that. We're, we're fortunate that Sky and Razi, that island grouping, does have the four-member ward, and it's only really an issue for Cool and Malig. And I think the, the members there are very cognizant of the island issues, the, the small isles in particular. So. We're less um, deterministic, I guess, than, than some other responses. So do you think local authorities should be consulted by uh, the uh, government and or the Boundary Commission in regards to uh, putting in a number of councillors in particular wards? And I don't know if you have area committees. Do you think, uh, the same as I asked the last panel, do you think an area committee should be totally devolved to uh, islands? We do have an area committee for Sky and Razi, which I mentioned earlier. And in the case of the small isles, they're in with the Lochaber um, area committee. And I think that does ensure good representation. They're also able to bring those issues to the wider Highland Council. So I don't think it's so much of an issue. Of course, the islanders on the, on the small isles and on the egg, they may feel differently, but we need to consult with them. And I think that's back to your point about the need for consultation with these communities. Can you remind me how many councillors you have in Highlands? Um, there are 74 councillors in Highland. Right, so you should get the same as... Uh, we, we have had a reduction, actually. It was 80 before. Oh, OK. That's, uh, that's amazing. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we're not going to develop that debate here. Uh, and I'm going to ask Peter Chapman to, to lead the next section. Yeah, okay. hello, panel. Uh, my... Uh, questions is about provision in the bill on marine development. Uh, you know that it provides a regulation making power to Scottish ministers to establish a mean marine licensing scheme. Um, and my question is, do you agree with the regulation making power introduced in the bill? And, and how do you feel it could be used in practice? Would you like to head off on that? Um, yes, I think the Provision for the marine licensing scheme is, is welcomed by the Council. We've, we've sought to in increase our influence over the marine environment around the coast of Highlands and around the coast of our, our island communities. So it is welcome, but I think echoing the points made in the previous um, di discussion around the resourcing of it, that could be particularly difficult. But we do want to have greater control and greater say. I think communities in the past have been frustrated by the lack of ability to influence developments around the coastal area. So that is something that we are keen to see. And have, you, have, you got, have, you got a, have you got an idea how you, you can see it working in practice? I, th I think, the, again, the devil will be in the detail, but there are frustrations I, I know from the past 
around um, some of the licensing conditions and some of the rentals that were required from the Crown Estate, for example, for developments around the Highland Coast. Mm -hmm. And it was felt that there was very lim limited say from the local community on what was happening. And then the revenues were lost to the local area. So we do want to see more control over that locally. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring Norman in uh, there, if I may, please. I think uh, um, I, I support what uh, Stuart's saying there. And, and it is entirely linked with, with the devolution of the Crown Estate to, to the Scottish Government and hopefully down to communities as well, and, and putting a significantly a greater degree of control in their hands. As a local authority, historically, we knew nothing of marine developments, predominantly aquaculture developments, until we got the planning application for the, the shore-based development. And by that time, all the consents and everything had been signed, done and dusted, and nobody in the community would know anything about it. And it is about, it is about having a lever uh, so that we have greater control uh, within our communities, not necessarily within the local authority, but within our communities uh, of what happens within the marine environment, as, as our communities currently do with the land-based environment. Uh, I can't imagine it's... I would imagine it's an awful lot easier to manage the marine environment rather than the land-based environment, which is which is cluttered with people in some in some areas. Uh, you get a lot more opposition and con and concerns raised by people than we do from from anything that lives in the marine environment. So, so I, c I don't see it as an insurmountable problem uh, for communities to take greater control of that. And a licensing regime is probably the best way to do that. Mm. Peter, Peter, do you want to follow that? I just, I just wonder, and you, is there an expectation from, from all uh, local authorities that they will take up this, this power? I mean, is that, is that the feeling that you have, that you, will, you would want to uh, get involved in this? I, I suspect some councils will and, and some councils won't, to be honest. There is experience, of course, in the Northern Isles uh, of, of a works licensing regime already run by the local authority within its specific harbour area, and that, uh, that I believe, works, works very well indeed and, and, and quite harmoniously with other regulatory interests. So I, I imagine very much that those authorities with significant coastal areas and who have, which have strong views about the management of these areas will want to take up this, this, this scheme, but I imagine that not all authorities will. Um, does anyone have a different opinion to that, or Peter, are you happy with that? We may move on. Well, just one, one other bit. Have you, have you consulted with the local communities on this part of the bill at all, or, and, and what kind of feedback have you had? Stuart, do you want to go with that? I think in general, Highland Council has a long history of looking at the Crown Estate and issues relating to Crown Estate matters and, and marine matters. So generally, there, there is a very favourable response to this when com consulting with communities. Ma for our Malcolm or Norman, who so would like to come in? Just for our part, we, ha we, ha we have demands coming from our communities to take, con to take greater control down to community le uh, level of what happens in the marine environment. I mean, they're demanding of us to do something about it, and that is why, why the issue has been raised in this way within the bill. It is one of very few specifics in that sense that is, that is contained within the bill, and that we believe is for good reason. Okay, thanks. Uh, the final bit, uh, uh, John. Thanks, Convener. I mean, we have um, already touched on finance as we've gone through. So just a kind of maybe summing up question on the financial memorandum. Are you, are you comfortable with the financial memorandum? Do you think the costs for administration are, are reasonable? Uh, do you think there should be any other costs that are included that are not there? No, we are really very content with the financial memorandum. I mean, obviously, there will be a... There will be a there will be an element of trial when, when, if the bill is enacted and, and these, these processes are, are, are set up. But we, 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 have, we, have, we have estimated that um, what's, in the, what's in the financial memorandum is, is reasonable. Thank you. Does anyone, Jamie, sorry. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to follow up uh, from John's question, um, I think there needs to be a differential between the cost of the implementation of island proofing, for example, versus the cost of uh, doing the island proofing itself. So the administrative costs of doing it versus the actual realities of having to implement the consequences and the outcomes of that impact assessment. To give you an example, uh, access to uh, healthcare provision on the mainland, for example, people 
uh, travelling from island communities to access specialist services on a mainland hospital. Uh, tr <coughs> true island proofing would mean that the provision of those services may have to be available on an island instead of on the mainland. The cost impl Im Im uh, implication of that is tremendous. So as a local authority, are you comfortable that you have adequate funding to back up the concept of island proofing? Because this bill doesn't really come with any additional resource or funding to councils at all. Malcolm, do you want to come? Just to be clear, I was referring to the implementation of the, of, of the, of the bill uh, rather, than, rather than the consequences. I think that's, that's a process which, which we're already engaged in. I mean, island, island councils benefit from special islands needs allowance. Um, we have a level of GAE. Um, I'm not saying I'm far from saying it's adequate for our for our needs, of course, but it does recognise uh, it does recognise some difference in the delivery of services uh, in island communities. It's exactly that kind of negotiation, that kind of discussion, uh, on a formal basis that this that this bill, I think. Uh, one of, the, one, is, one of its key elements is, is, is putting that on a formal uh, and a constitutional uh, and, a, and a basis that's clear both for, for the agencies which work with us uh, and the services which we provide. And that, that's why I keep emphasising it is part of our community empowerment local governance agenda. It doesn't stand apart from that. It is absolutely, uh, it is absolutely critically part of how we deal with... Um, the future, the future delivery of public services in our communities. Stuart, do you want to add anything or do you feel that's covered it? I think in terms of Highland Council, obviously if there are additional costs and there are in, in delivering services on islands and if rural proofing leads to higher impacts on, on the council overall, then clearly we're not funded to do that at, at the present time and it will be a question of members taking a view on, on where the priorities are. So I, I think the point that Malcolm made around the additional costs of the activity that relates from the island proofing, that is something that needs to be considered by, by public bodies. And I think on, a, on an islands plan, for example, there would be an expectation, I feel, in the island communities that some resource would, would come from that. Uh, to help Im implement some of the ideas within those plans. So I think it will have cost implications beyond the actual implementation of the legislation itself. I think that's probably a, a good place to leave it, uh, I think, at that stage. Norman, Malcolm, Stuart, thank you very much for, for coming and giving evidence uh, to the committee. We have got further evidence uh, on the Boundary Commission uh, relating to this uh, next week. But thank you very much for your time. And I'm now going to uh, move the meeting in, into private session. And uh, so thank you very much. And that closes the footage.